It's Grandma. Time for another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Tonight's story, Gray's Harbor Music. Hello there. I've noticed in the news that the Gray's Harbor Symphony Orchestra has its membership drive in full swing. And I'm informed that the support this year is good. It should be, because Gray's Harbor enjoys a unique position in the musical way. And so far, so much, many evidence of human improvement. Our local position in the music world can be pretty much traced to one man. The story of music on Gray's Harbor is a yarn that has been written largely during the last quarter of a century. That's right. It's, it has taken just a generation to build the high standard of music performance and appreciation that Gray's Harbor enjoys. And if you go back 25 years, you'll find its beginning in the mind of one man, a well-known man too, who is still a factor in its continued progress and moving spirit is raising the harbor standard of good music still higher. It's the story that I have been wanting to tell for some time, but I've been putting off just for such an occasion, just prior to the first symphony program. And since that's coming up on December 4th, this seems like a good time to tell you how music got its start on the harbor and how the big cities on the east look to this little gafting of civilization onto the hill of the last wilderness as a spot in America that they produce great musicians. But following our custom, here's Dick Crombie with a few words from our sponsor. Now, music as music inspires, has existed in Grace Harbor as long pro proportionately as it has anywhere. Back before the days of the Aberdeen Fire, Bill Appleyard, that dean of maestros, was flailing his baton over the puffy cheek torn tutors of the fire department band, a brass and string organization that could be counted on the tooting dignitaries into town or to play a concert in the town square with about 24 hours notice. Around 1907, the bands became prolific. The old city directories list the Aberdeen City Band, directed by Sven Wetland, Fletcher's Orchestra with Bill Fletcher himself as arranger and conductor, and Wanichek's Family Bohemian Orchestra, managed and directed by Joe Wanichek. By this time, the harbor was developing a musical consciousness. Cosmopolis proudly pointed to Bergen's orchestra and Eldred's orchestra as evidence of its cultural advancement. In Hoquiam, the band was led by A.E. Wade, who also directed the modern Wozman musical organization. John Kitaleta headed the Swedish band and another musical group that he called the Western Echo Band, while the Woodmen of the world thumped and tooted to the downbeat administrated by leader Louis Dunning. Yes, on the paper at least, Grace Harbor was coming to be a four, a four leader in musical aptitude. Moreover, some of its young people were showing a marked aptitude for music. Two Aberdeen students, Susie Williams and Frederick Hart, displayed a talent and big things were prophesied for them and those who prophesied and hoped were not disappointed. For the Grays Harbor in 1908 would hear some day that Susie Williams was performing as concert mistress with the famed Boston Symphony Orchestra, while Fred Hart was a distinguished instructor in the New York Conservatory. But, by and large, the music that the town played and heard was small, thin note compared to the whine of the saw in the fresh fur and the boom of the boat whistle. The young men or women who sought to explore the realm of music did so as their parents had explored the western frontier before settling on Grace Harbor. 
It was pioneer stuff. True, there were eight music teachers giving lessons in Hoakley in 1908 and five teaching music in Aberdeen. But few were, few were young hopefuls who got beyond the elementary stage. And those who did play the senior march or graduation night and found themselves in great demand for amateur performances. If a young fellow was trapped by his fond parents into taking up the fiddle or the coronet, he became a lonely fugitive from the music stand, an object of pity to his fellow travelers who watched him through the windows, sighing or tooting when the big game was about to start. Generally, there was little sympathy for certainly no consummation for the youngster who found himself a mess in the world of music. But along in the early teens, the high schools of Hoquiam and Aberdeen began to display an interest in the art. School orchestras were formed without more than a minimum of direction or assistance, and they struggled through their early school years, wilting away at the few most unrecognizable selections to play at the graduation exercise. And then, over in Aberdeen, two rather coincidental events shaped up the course of music in Grays Harbor, as though they had been planned together. Aberdeen High School got a new principal, and one who had some definite ideas about music. At this same time, the late E.C. Finch, looking about for a worthwhile charity to endow, decided to provide the instruments to instruct the Aberdeen Boy Scout Band. The first mentioned influence was the first felt. Richard C. Balcom assumed the reins of the Weatherwax High School and vowed that not while he was principal would it present a musical organization as bad as some of those that had gone before. Still wincing at the thought of some of the notes he could recall, he went shopping for musicians who would organize and orchestrate for the school and make a real orchestra, as he described it, that could play a tune that everyone could recognize. He found John Kiefer, Aberdeen Post Office employer and amateur musician. John was willing. It was 1923 and Aberdeen High School was about to have its first orchestra. When the students of the high school were asked to indicate their ability and to play an instrument, Principal Balcom produced eight violins, a clarinet, a trumpet, a trombone, piano and drums, and 13 strong, 13 strong. The school's first preeminent orchestra began to tune up. The musicians ran the distance from distinguished talent to the most inept students of the muse. But under John Kiefer's baton, they managed to wreak out selections that the listeners recognized. Encouraged at the support for music, the town's music teachers increased their enrollments and music was on the upswing. It was at this time that Ned Finch dropped a deluge of silver into the lap of Edward Riley Bailey Parkinson, the Boy Scout director, and told him to buy instruments and hire an instructor for a 30-piece band. And music got its second big lift. From Seattle came P.G. Caraba, clarinet and flattest, and the instructor in instruments for a brass band. P.J. was a little man, an excitable, temperamental Italian music master, but he managed his temperament well enough to handle 30 live-wire Aberdeen boys in the vicinity of 12 years of age. And as they tootled and honked, thumped and twittered, the sounds that came from the basement of the Aberdeen Methodist Church's gymnasium improved in quality and Carabara would accept nothing but progress. He kept a 12-year-old George Savage for extra time when his lesson was not good, and a New York paper mill executive named Robert Leroy can still recall that he stayed for extra tutoring when, Mr. F when his French horn exercises were not up to par. A boy named Ever Berlin, whose friends were adamant that their belief that he would never learn to play his bass horn blossomed into a full-fledged umped, umped artist under the flaring baton of Pietro Carabara. For public demonstrations, parades, the scout activities, the band performed, 
And while Sousa gave no worries to his horns, still the community was proud of its juvenile music makers, and music, though some doubted it, was gaining a foothold in Grace Harbor. After years under John Kafer, during the during which Aberdeen High School's orchestra rose to never previously scaled heights, Principal Balkan, who was aiming high, obtained the services of a full-time musical instructor for his music department. There lies the story in itself, for the instructor was Robert Ziegler, one-time protege to Netherlands royalty, an old world precisionado with a photogenic temperament and a lifetime of professional music experience. Bob Ziegler had landed on Grays Harbor after the First World War, in which he served as bandmaster. With his family, he settled here, and in the days of piano accompaniment to the galloping hoofs of motion picture writers, Ziegler pounded out his own accompaniment to silent pictures. He was a pianist at the Old Bijou, whose head seemed to be on a pivot so that he could watch the audience behind him while rattling off the cavalry charge and the hearts of flowers. But Bob Ziegler knew music, and he was available for full-time instruction, and he took over. By this time, the Aberdeen High School musical representation, which a year before could scratch up only eight fiddles, had been reinforced with instruments of the Boy Scout band. The oldest of these boys were now entering high school, and the school could now boast a 25-pace orchestra that played such things that involved Hayden, Schubert, and Grigg. It also had a 75-voice chorus and produced a musical comedy with nine solo voices. And this year, for the first time in musical history, Grace Harbor was represented at the Southwest Washington Music Meet in Centralia. Moreover, it placed several of its entrants. The following year, the school placed two first in the annual music contest when Evelyn Fletcher, the daughter of pioneer orchestra leader, won the blue ribbon for violins, and a girls' quartet composed of Marjorie Douglas, Dorothy Hancock, Helen Steiner, and Phoebe McNeil carried away the honors in their competition. The orchestra and mixed chorus performed placed second, and Aberdeen amassed enough points to place second to Vancouver. On that day, if on any single day, the name of Aberdeen began to appear as the school to reckon with in musical competitions. In 1927, when music had made a full-time study in the Aberdeen curriculum, the school board obtained the services of a Washington State College music graduate named Lewis Worson. It was a fortunate choice, and that year, and every year since, the name of Aberdeen has appeared in the highest available ratings in the Southwest Washington music competitions. And under the baton of this unusual young man, the school placed consistently with the highest ratings of the national regional music competitions. And the name of the sawdust town on the Pacific Tidewater that had once been known for the roughest port of call on the Pacific coast became known as an excellence of musical departments. It had one of the first uniformed bands among high schools southwestern Washington. It offered individual instructions for instrumentalists and it carried its efforts outside of the school system to form the first professionally qualified organization of a community symphony. By this time, the serious musicians of the state were looking to Aberdeen for leadership in their efforts. The more so because Hoquiam had included a similar program in its school system and the other schools of the state were hurrying to compete. When Worson left to take position as head public school music for Tacoma, his position was sought by many. But Vic McClellan, was selected to follow, and successfully Mark Freshman, Kenneth Hollervick, and finally Don McCaw, local boy who had started his own musical learning under Worsen, returned to direct the system. By this time, the largest school system of the nations were looking at Aberdeen for talent. McClellan went to Seattle. Harvesek assumed the directorship of public schools of music in Baltimore, one of the biggest and most 
exacting music jobs in the nation, and Louis Worson moved up to Philadelphia, where he now directs the functions of the big city's vast musical education program. The job of director of music at Aberdeen School now contains so much prestige that directors apply for the position in the past have turned down all authors awaiting for a decision by the local board on their application. Directors have taken lower salaries in order to obtain the Aberdeen position and have rated the position of director of public school music in Aberdeen as number one plum in the state and cities combined. And now, Dick, a few words from our sponsors. Well, we've told you in a quick and sparse way about the surge of music that lifted the culture of the entire community because of a wealthy man who wanted to sponsor a band and an educator who wanted the orchestra to play a tune so that it could be recognized. There's an old saying about a prophet who is without honor in his own country, and there is a hero who is, who is unsung in his lifetime. But I had the feeling that as the Grace Harbor Symphony gets ready to tune its fiddles and tighten up its kettle drums heads for its coronet on December 4th, that the people who take the time to think of it connect this rather remarkable community project with a man and an idea. The man, of course, being Richard R. Balcom, principal of Weatherwack High School, who has seen his school's musicians give the highest ratings in the state competition for 21 years, and who has been the scores, source for years, the chairman of the Southwest Washington Music Committee. It is the story that would hardly be remarkable if a man himself was a frustrated musician who had blown the bassoon in his youth or scraped the cello. But it is remarkable because the man who came to lead the local school system with a determination that the sawdust community should have its full share of the better things and that was something to educate besides reading and writing and arithmetic and that has given the opportunity that would flourish. And when the school's auditorium is filled with enthusiastic audience of hundreds next Sunday, that in itself would be a tribute to the man who more than 30 who more than any other has given this community one of the finest civic musical organizations in the nation and has won for himself an important place in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.